if you grew up around the TV set in the 1970s, even into the early 1980s, it was hard to miss this guy. Um, he had people laughing every week, sometimes brought people to tears every week. Didn't do it as a comedian, did it as a great comedy actor on one of the most beloved shows of all time. Jamie Farr from Mass. Thank you, David. Pleasure what to a nice you. thing for you to say. Oh, well, you, 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 had, true. you had that show down perfect. Yeah, we gave you tears, we gave you laughs, and it was a wonderfully written and directed and acted show. And yet, before you got to that, I mean, that show was the role of a lifetime for you, I would imagine. It was indeed. why you're able to be here. In, in Correct. Facebook, gives you know, that fame, yes. Yeah, it, it gives you the, you know, the, the credibility. Right. Thing. You had a great career up to that. I mean, uh, 1955. Well, with, with, I had um, Blackboard with, Jungle at MGM at the heyday of the studio. But as, as Santini, a mentally challenged character. Now, right. that's got to be... Uh, a, a, an incredible challenge for someone just starting out. I, I was a young man. I was uh, doing a play at the Pasadena Playhouse, and a talent scout from MGM saw me. They were casting for this movie, Blackboard Jungles, about teenagers in New York City. And they said, Will you test for this? And I came in, saw the, the role. Actually, I tested. It wasn't with Len Ford, who played the teacher in that, Daddy A. It was uh, James Drury, who later became the Virginian on television, but he was also a, a contract player there at MGM. I got the part. I was actually the only one from the Los Angeles area that got one of the major roles in there. Everybody else came from New York. Uh, Sidney Poitier, Vic Morrow, uh, Paul Mazursky, Raphael Campos, <laughs> Richard Kiley, everybody came from New York. Wow. And, and Richard and, Brooks so really, was the director, great director, uh, won Academy Award for Almer Gantry, did Lord Jim, uh, many, many movies. When you did that film, did you think, okay, my career, we're off to the races now yes. and everything, but it didn't actually happen no, that way, it did it? No, it didn't happen at all. <laughs> uh, I, I wound up uh, having to get a job at a, uh, on a chinchilla farm in Burbank, California, I was cleaning chinchilla dropping pans out at the time. <laughs> I, here, my picture had been on, in Life magazine, all right? Remember the great magazine, sure Life knew. magazine? Big headshot of me and the whole story about all of us being in the movie. And I thought, oh, my career was going to take off. Nothing, got nothing. You know, they always say in our business, once a, uh, once an actor, always a waiter. Right. In this case, I became a, a cleaning up person of a chinchilla dropping pan area. But you, but you didn't give up on it. No, think. no. I mean, Actually, I was in class with Clint Eastwood at the time, and Clint was cleaning swimming pools. So it's amazing. Well, I wonder what ever happened to Clint. Yeah, really. Did, did he ever <laughs> yeah. do anything in the yeah. business? I'm just curious. Maybe he owns a swimming pool place where you <laughs> clean pools. Do you, do you ever see any of the guys that you came up with back oh, in, in those the days? all the time. Yeah. I, of course, I'm at that age now where a lot of them have passed away. Uh, another wonderful actor uh, that was part of that class uh, that Clint was in and I was in was uh, uh, Robert Donner. He was on the show Mork and Mindy. Mm -hmm. Nick Adams, the actor who uh, was in Rebel Without a Cause with uh, James Dean and Natalie Wood. Uh, he was in that class. Uh, Irish McCullough, who was uh, Sheena, the Jungle Queen. Do you ever go down memory lane and say, wow, sure. can you believe it's been 50, 60 years? Yeah, yeah but as years? I said, some of them, you know, some of them eventually gave up. This is my, I guess, 50, 60 year in the business as a professional. So, uh, yeah, a lot of them, as you say, passed away or some of them just quit. I had good careers, but didn't want to do it anymore. So I'm still around. There's something wrong with me. Then, I, then, I have that, to, then that Eastwood guy, whose name rings a bell, yeah, I yeah, can't, he's, can't he's, imagine what, he, what yeah. he's done. Oh, he's me. a wonderful director and a yeah. wonderful guy. I, he, uh, he, he's not uh, a snob at all. You see him someplace, and he's as friendly and nice as uh, the days when we were struggling. From the Chinchilla Farm, though, you ended up doing a lot of um, weekly variety shows. About, I started, uh, actually, what happened, I, I, I was in a play called Mr. Roberts with a wonderful actor by the name of Craig Stevens. Craig had been a big uh, star, a, a contract player at Warner Brothers for many years. He was also married to a big name there, Al Alexis Smith. Mm -hmm. And Craig was, uh, uh, was in Mr. Roberts, and then he got this television pilot for CBS called The Mighty O. And there was a part in it of a, of a sailor who had a large nose. And his name was Schnorkel, and he was the buddy of the cook on the ship named Cookie. And I'm trying to, Jack Prince played uh, Cookie in it. Well, we did the pilot. It was a wonderful pilot, but it didn't sell. And Sherwood Schwartz, who was the head writer for Red Skelton, Sherwood, who later did The Brady Bunch and, of course, Gilligan's <laughs> Island, saw the pilot and he said, I'm looking for some characters for Red to play. And I like this character of the cook 
for Red Skelton and get this kid, he's kind of funny, uh, to play his sidekick and they could be two guys in the Navy and, and they can mix and match and do things like he did with uh, Freddy the Freeloader mm -hmm. and Dead Eye and Willie Lump Lump and all the other characters, uh, Cauliflower and McPug. Uh, so they called me in and I went up to meet Red Skelton at his home. He liked me very much and they wound up writing the show. And the irony of it all is that I play a sailor with him and we're in, uh, in, in the area near Korea and we find this uh, Korean orphan. And he falls in love with the Korean orphan and he wants to adopt him when, we, when the ship docks into San Francisco. The only thing is you have to be married. So he figured he'll dress me up as his wife and try to convince the, the orphanage that, uh, that <laughs> we should be husband and wife and adopt the baby. Well, it, that was the first time I'd ever been in women's clothing. But this was, they had lipstick on me and they, they gave me you know, false breasts and, and high heels and, they, and it just broke red up. It, it was absolutely hysterical. But I'm seeing, this is 15 years before oh, you would play yes. Corporal Klinger right, who, right. who dressed in drag right. in Korea. Right. I mean, there's some parallels there. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, I did uh, quite a few of the shows with Red and my career was taking off then. I thought this was going to be no it. More I was up farm? No, no more chinchilla farm. farms. farms. I, uh, I was being requested all over the place uh, for movies, for television series, for a variety of shows, etc. And then, lo and behold, I got drafted into the real army and I had to serve. So I took my basic training at uh, Fort Ord, California. I wound up being shipped to New York City at the Army Pictorial Center, which was the old Paramount Studios mm -hmm. where they did all the Marx Brothers and W.C. Fields films. That was now the Signal Corps capital for them. And then I went on temporary duty uh, doing training films and then eventually got shipped out to Japan. So I was, a, uh, I was with Armed Forces Radio in a little village outside of Tokyo called the Sakamachi with Far East Network. And Red Skelton's son, Richard, passed away from leukemia. He wanted to entertain the troops. He requested me from the State Department. I was just a private. Got VIP status, flew on a private, <laughs> flew on a United Nations airplane with VIP status. We landed in Seoul, Korea, and, and I went with Red all the way up to the 38th parallel entertaining the troops. And when we got back, he said, you know, Jamie, things are going to be tough for you when you come back. You come and see me. And I thought that was a nice thing for him to say. Uh, I went back to Korea a couple of times to open Armed Forces Television. I finally got uh, my uh, my active uh, duty over with. In those days, you had to put in six years. So, but, but basically, you were still in show business, although you were in the Army's version of show exactly. business, making a lot right. less money. Exactly. Yeah. A whole lot less a money. A lot less money. Yeah. And, and a private. Right, yeah. a private. So anyway, what happened was uh, I, I had put my two years of active duty in. I needed two years of active reserve and two years of inactive reserve before I got my discharge. I got out, started to re resurrect my career in Hollywood. Clint was then doing Rawhide, and Dan Blocker was doing Bonanza. Uh, Craig was doing uh, uh, Peter Gunn, and that. And I was trying to get going and back in the business. I couldn't even get an agent, and my father passed away. And we had no money, so I was going to have to go home to help support my mom. There was just the two of us. And I went to say goodbye to Red at CBS, Television City, and he would not hear any of this. He says, you are a doctor of comedy. I'm not going to let you go. I told you that things would be tough for you. Reached in his robe pocket, pulled out a big wad of bills, money, gave them to me. He says, you send that home to your mother. As of right now, you're under personal contract to me. I want you to report to the house wow. up in Bel Air. And you're going to be on my show. You're going to travel with me to all the nightclubs of Shea Puri in Chicago, Fountain Blue in Miami Beach, the Sands in Las Vegas, etc. So he actually saved, saved my career. So you, you did stage comedy at, I, I did in not clubs, do, no? I, no, I didn't no. do that. What I did for Red, because Red didn't need any help. Right, he, didn't say, need, yeah, he didn't need he any sidekick right. or anything. What I did was when he did his pantomimes or sound effect things, there was a machine called the McKenzie machine. So um, on his TV show, I did the comedy bits and everything right. else. But when I traveled with him, I did his announcing for him. Because Red never wanted somebody to come out. And one of the greatest comedians, and ladies and gentlemen, he's an MGM star. All he wanted you to do was, ladies and gentlemen, one of America's clowns, Red Skelton. That, was, said it that was the I intro. Mean, with this machine, the McKenzie machine, it had all kinds of sound effects in it. So because of my comedy timing and knowing Red's bits, 
the, the regular sound man couldn't go with him because he was uh, under contract to CBS. So I went with him and I knew that machine frontwards and backwards and everything else. So anything I knew, I watched him and I could tell. He didn't even have to signal me. I knew when to put effects in for him. So that's how I got along uh, with Red. And then eventually uh, I, I, I left Red to go on my own because obviously I wanted to do other things. He was very gracious about it and I, uh, I went out there and uh, hit the pavement and got myself an agent and and, uh, ended up on the Danny Kay show. I did the Danny Kay show. Uh, right? show. Yes, indeed. I was with Harvey Corman, and we had all the Sid Caesar writers. God. We had they, they're the best writers. So one of the bits we did, we did a takeoff on uh, westerns. We did the western the way it should be done, with the cowboy hats and everybody with the guns and strumming a guitar. And I come in at the end. And I said, "Okay, put your hands up." And Danny Kay shoots me, and I go. <laughs> Ouch! And I die. So then we did it the way the Scottish people would do a western. Everybody's in kilts. They got bagpipes instead of the guitars and everything. And he got get your get your hands up. And he shoots me, and I go make ouch, and I die. So then we did it the way with the Russians would do it. You know, we had the hats on, the balalaika, and everything else. And I go, okay, put your hands up, and he shoots me, and I go, ouch, Chanya. <laughs> so the you clever some, writing with it, but the, the, not only the clever writing, but you got to do a lot of physical comedy. Oh, sure, with Danny, you had and Harvey Corman. Right. I mean, this was uh, another great schooling because, in my estimation, I think Danny was probably the greatest of our speaking comedy comedians for movies. Mm -hmm. I, I, his his serious things, Hans Christian Andersen, and all the other movies, but. His uh, Secret Life of Walter Mitty, the court yeah. jester, with the the uh, the fl flagon with the dragon and the the pestle with the vessel. You know? Right. <laughs> it's, a, it's I stand here and I laugh. I just think of it. And I start laughing. All right. Let's f fast forward through the '60s because yeah. you worked steadily. Yeah. Um, everything from from TV to motion pictures. You even did a Wonder Bread commercial that was did Wonder uh, you Bread. Know, with like I having did, a hit yeah, series. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And you get offered a part in, in MASH, which was supposed to be a one-off. Uh, one day. The character of, of, yeah, of Klinger, one right? One day, yeah, I just had four lines in it. Uh, I, I didn't even see the part, I didn't know what I was playing. All I cared about was I was able to pay my rent and buy groceries. Uh, so Gene Reynolds, uh, the agent said, show up, Gene will tell you what it is when you get there. And I went into this trailer dressing room outside of stage nine and there was a women's Army Corps uh, outfit hanging up in high heels. And he said, uh, put it on, it's yours. I thought I was dressing with an actress. He said, no, that's yours, put it on. So I put it on, I, they started laughing. I went out there and, and the crew was laughing, the cast was laughing. I did my four lines, they fell on the floor. And uh, as I say, I came out for one day and stayed for 11 years. They just kept promoting the character until the uh, third year I was finally put under contract to them. Oh, it took them three years to do yeah, But yeah. you were in basically every episode, though. I wasn't. In the first year, I think I right. was in about six out of the uh, the 20 some that was done. The second year, I was in about 13 of them. And then the third year is when they put me under contract. So it was, a, you know, at that time, it's a half hour show. They had uh, lots of characters right. in it. And they needed a shakedown. They, some of the characters uh, over overlapped uh, some of the other characters. So what they had to finally do is say, okay, Okay, these two characters are, are similar. We want characters that are indelible, things that, that you, the other people that cannot be the same. So that's why they got down to the seven characters of Hawkeye and Trapper right. and Hot Lips and Major Burns and, and Colonel Blake and Radar and, and, uh, and, and Klinger. Klinger. You know, so they were the, wound up with the seven, seven wonderful characters that they had. When Gary Berghoff left the show yes. uh, of, of his own choosing, he, yes. he decided to leave the show. Right. Um, Everybody that left the show did it on right, their own choosing. Uh, right. Um, um, I'm uh, for, McLean, McLean Stevenson, Stevenson well, Wayne, Wayne Rogers, Rogers Larry left Linville, them. and then finally Gary Berghoff. Right? I, I don't know why they would do that, but that's, that was their decision. Yeah, I but, know. I, you know we, they, they were afraid, I think, they were being typecast. Right. It, might, it was too late by that time. But I was going to say, for you, <laughs> it was too late. Take the money. <laughs> right, but, I, mean, I mean, look at Alan. Alan Alder was, was, it was uh, Hawkeye, was Hawkeye yeah. but he was also able to do the Carl Chessman film Oh, sure. On well, TV. that was before he did. Uh, before he was did. that before Matt? Yeah, I that thought was before Matt. I thought that was during Matt. It was called The Glass Something. Uh, no, no, Carl no. Carl Chesman thing, yeah, was it? No, no. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, no, kill, he did. Kill, kill me if you can. Kill me if you can. And that was in 77. Oh, okay. That well, was in 77. And he also you're did, probably uh, uh, right. But, but he, he did what, same time next that's year. That's what I was going to say. He did, he same, did same time, time next year. year. That's, that's so he was he able to, to get past Yes, he Hawkeye. transcended that. Yeah. Um, but, but when Gary left the show, they took Klinger and they promoted him from Corporal right. to Sergeant. 
And you lost the, you lost the drag. Yeah, and, and people were worried. They thought, oh, that was a shtick. You know, that, that's the only thing right. you could do. But they found other things for me to do. And also, they didn't want to bring in another character. Why bring in another character when you can take this character, who's already funny, and do more funny things with him, but in a different area? Did you want to make the change like that? It or, didn't bother it didn't me. Bother? I, I, I was secure enough as an actor that I knew that, that if that was my only shtick, then I couldn't have done the other things, even in drag, that I did, where some of the things, as you pointed out earlier, that I make people cry in some areas. Right. So, yeah, I, I wasn't, uh, you know, a good actor is a good, I'm not, I'm not uh, giving kudos to myself, but I'm a trained actor, and I've worked with a lot of fine people in, in the business. So, I, I, when it comes to the acting end of it, I, I pretty much know where I want to go with something. So, I was very trustworthy of, of a Larry Gelbart, of a Gene Reynolds, of a Burt Metcalf, of the writers that we had uh, on the show. If you can't trust those people, you can't trust anybody in this business. Jamie, before I let you go, I, I got to ask that show ran for 11 years. Yes. One of the most beloved and honored shows the in highest history. Rated highest yet in the rated history of television. Exactly. Can there be another show like MASH? Given the way the TV is today, I, I don't know because uh, I, you know I don't know what's in the minds of the executives. Uh, television goes in cycles. That was the that was one of the golden eras of television because you had that Saturday Night lineup yeah. where, where you had uh, All in the Family, Mary Tyler Moore, Bob Newhart, Mash, uh, Carol Burnett's show, all on one network, all on one on network in one night. Nobody right. left their homes. Nobody went to the movie theaters. They went. They didn't go to restaurants. So I, I can't tell you whether that is. I, today, comedy's a little different, so. All right, I know that they're holding a, a, yeah, a right. seat at the dinner table for thank you. Thank you. Jamie, I want to thank you. Appreciate that, David. Pleasure spending some time with All you. All right. Take care, continued success. Thank you, I appreciate that.